Palantir just reported revenue growth that was unfortunately the slowest revenue growth for the company's history. But there is a lot of hidden really good news within this report here. So first off, you know, the most important thing you need to know about this report is that the company now expects to be listed in the S&P 500. So they're expected to be added to the S&P 500. This is a huge huge news event and will be an extremely bullish driver for share prices as um you know there are extremely there are, there is an extreme amount of money invested in the S&P 500 and also the way passive investment works is there are ETFs that are based purely on the S&P 500. So there are ETFs that buy exactly what the S&P 500 buys. So therefore, the the full effect of an S&P 500 inclusion isn't just um, you know who will buy purely off of the S&P 500. It's those funds that mirror the S&P 500 that will also see a massive amount of forced buying for Palantir. So this is a huge deal for, for the company and is going to be a major growth driver for shares to be included in the S&P 500. It's really a huge deal. I really can't understate that at all. So with that being said, I'll go over some of the financial results for the company. So Palantir reported a 13% increase in revenue. And like I said, that is that topped analyst estimates, but unfortunately, it's still the slowest revenue growth for the company in its history. And then the company also reported EPS of five cents. So positive EPS is definitely a good thing. And EPS was basically right in line with analyst ex expectations. And then Palantir also reported $28 million or one cent per share in net income, comparing to a net loss of $179 million. So they're turning that net loss into net income, which is a great sign. Love to see that that the company is moving in the right direction. And then the data analytics company said third quarter revenues will likely be between about 553 million to 557 million ahead of analyst expectations. So they guided above expectations, which is good. So so they reported EPS and revenue above expectations, and they also gave guidance that was above expectations. So you may be thinking, why is this company falling? It's 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 a bit questioning, and obviously there's some negatives here, but in my opinion, I would say, you know, this is a, a pretty big buying opportunity for the stock if you're long shares, and I'll get into, you know, the financials in a little bit. I'll also give a price Per prediction at the end of this video. Um, so if you want to know kind of where shares are going based on technical analysis, stick around until the end of the video. That'll be the last thing I cover. So, and on the S&P 500 note, so the company says we anticipate that we will be become eligible for inclusion in the S&P 500 after we report our financial results for Q3 of 2023 in early November. At that point, we will have profitable we will have had been profitable on a cumulative basis over the preceding four quarters. So for those that don't know, there are re requirements to get added into the S&P 500. You need to be profitable over the past four quarters. There are also some other market cap um, requirements and measurements you have to hit. So, so the company is basically hitting all its measurements besides that profitability me um, measurement. So four quarters of profitability, which they should hit in this next quarter, which will cause the S&P 500 inclusion, which as I explained, would be a massive uh, you know driver for shares and be a, you know, a huge tailwind. So also the, the company said its board approved a buyback program for the first time with the capacity to buy up to one billion dollars of shares. So that that's awesome. You know, you know, people talk a lot about uh, share dilution. Well, buybacks is the exact opposite, right? So um, you know that would be a huge, huge positive for for the stock as well. And then government revenue accounted for fifty seven percent of total sales. 
During the quarter, Palantir announced a contract from the U.S. Special Operations Command that could be worth up to $460 million. The company's fastest area of growth was international government revenue, which increased 31% to $76 million. So the company has a massive opportunity here. Obviously, AI is a big factor in this company as well. And Carp said Palantir's aim is to make money from AI rather than just Per produce computer generated poetry which is kind of a shot kind of a jab at chat gpt which i thought was kind of funny and then he, he also said we will figure out how to monetize it in regard to artificial intelligence so when we're talking about ai there's there's a much larger story to explain but i i did see a recent interview by dan ives which is one of the most respected people on wall street and he, he gave kind of a five-minute breakdown of Palantir's AI opportunity, which I will play for you right now. Dan, the messy of AI. I mean, that's a, that's a tall order right there. I think that's really what CARP's built. And, and in my opinion, it's still undiscovered as just a broader AI play, which is why I believe they're the messy of AI. I think there's a golden path right now for them to monetize what we view as potentially a trillion-dollar market opportunity and I think investors still have not recognized what this golden goose could be. Yeah, I mean, as we just mentioned, the stocks uh, moved pretty ferociously here um, in the last couple of months and, and since the start of the year. I, when you think about some of these newer AI applications in real time, they're already being applied on the battlefield. Case in point, Ukraine. Palantir is a key example of that. Do you think this is a situation where investors don't fully understand what this company does because so much of it is defense tech? And yes, I realize it's, it's expanding out to the commercial side, too. But there's a lot that they can't talk about, for example. Well, I think that's the biggest misperception. I can tell you, you know, we're talking to many in the 202 area code. The reputation of Palantir is, speaks for itself in terms of, you know, any sort of operations, three-letter agencies. Now, if you're an enterprise CIO, and this is the conversations I've had, you're looking toward AI platform approach, Palantir is potentially the first call. And that's why I think in this AI gold rush, what I view as the fourth industrial revolution, of course it's NVIDIA, Microsoft top of the mountain with Nadella. You look at second, third, fourth derivatives, right now Palantir front and center. And that's why I think this is a stock. You look at our bull case model, I think this is ultimately $25. And, and I think as they execute, more investors start to look at it. Wow, and the stock's trading at about uh, 17 or about 17.50 right now. Steve, want to get your thoughts on this, especially since Alex Karp, one of the co-founders and the current CEO of Palantir, uh, did pen a very, a very uh, long, yeah, very long op-ed in the New York Times about AI earlier this week. Yeah, and comparing it to Oppenheimer and how this is really an opportunity. We hear so much, at least this is Karp's view, we hear so much from the community developing AI about being responsible and safe. And, and even years ago, he brings up the examples of Microsoft employees upset about working with the Army and Google employees upset about doing the digital satellite imagery. Uh, he seems to kind of embrace it. I just want to pick out one quote from this. I mean, he calls for a, quote, more intimate collaboration between the state and technology sector, really comparing it to what Oppenheimer did, if you saw the movie or read the book or the history lesson about that, uh, you know, working hand in hand with the government before someone else does it. And he, he brings up the case about Ukraine. And I guess the other thing, Dan, I, I was kind of curious for your take on this, because there is a meme stockiness to Palantir, too. I'm wondering how much of that factors in into your calculation. Yeah, there too. no doubt. I mean, there's a huge retail presence. Right. And I think, but also, I think this is one where maybe retail has been ahead of institutional in terms of understanding the actual potential AI story. I can tell you, my conversations today, it's really institutional investors being like, okay, what am I missing in this story? Where is the actual total address on market opportunity? And can they go from government to commercial? Because I think when you start to look at it, that for them is really the opportunity. And if you're a CIO of an enterprise, there's no better reference accounts than those and those the two or two area it, well, But what does that look like? I mean, if you think about it, okay, so we, it's very opaque what they're doing on the, on the military side of it. I'm just curious, what does that look like on the commercial side? Like, what are you seeing there? And especially, I know they're growing some clients and so forth. What are you seeing there? I'd say from a platform yeah. approach in terms of scale and in terms of actual use cases, they're probably the first call. I, I think mm. they're probably in this market the purest AI play out there. Now, they built it. Others are coming. But it just speaks to our view in this fourth industrial revolution. 
Palantir is going to be a big player. The first time I ever heard a major company say machine learning came from Palantir. Yeah. 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 And of course, there's applications that, you know, supply chain, which is a big area now for many companies, manufacturing applications. Uh, there's something to be said about, okay, you work with the government, you work, you work on, you know, in a classified capacity, you have these high clearance, you know, high level clearances for things like cloud applications as well, which only a couple handful of companies do. Palantir is one of them. Um, you're going to keep my data safe. I'm sure there's probably um, that in of itself has a certain cachet with commercial clients, I would imagine. But how does it happen alongside an uncertain macro environment where people are tightening belts? And then, but, and then to the tightening belts, I think we started to see with IBM. I think we've saw with Microsoft, Google, and others. I mean, for big tech, we're seeing an uptick. I, ultimately, when it comes to AI, that's potentially 8 to 10% of budgets next year. And I do think you talk about reference accounts. You don't got to, you could sleep well at night when Palantir ultimately has your data in terms of from an AI use case perspective. And they're the only ones out there. They've proven it. Now they're proven in the enterprise. That becomes a bigger piece. That's why then the stock gets re rated, which is why we're bullish on it. A lot of interesting points made. And with that being said, I will go into the financials for the company. So right here, we can see Seeking Alpha shows me that valuation. In terms of valuation, the company is being graded out as a D minus. And then in terms of growth, we're at A plus and profitability, we're at B. I'll go into each of these categories here. So valuation, we, we're trading at 119 times PE, which is well above the sector median of 20, yes. Um, but when you consider that that the stock is newly profitable and its five-year average has been, um, you know, a non-existent PE, it 119 is definitely a good sign, and it shows that, that the company is moving towards profitability. An another metric that shows that as well is that over the next 12 months, we're projected to have a PE at 74 times. And obviously, 74 times is still above the sector median and well above the market multiple at about 25 times PE. But when you consider that we're moving from 120 times PE to 75, well, that just shows you that the company is moving closer and closer towards profitability, which is obviously a very good thing for the company and good for shareholders. Also, we can see price to book ratio at 12.1, which for those that don't know, price to book ratio just puts the market cap relative to the book value of a company. So this tells me that the market cap is 12.15 times the book value of its shares, a uh, book value of the of the company and inherently shares. Um, so let's look at some growth numbers for the for the company. So we can see here that revenue growth for the past twelve months has been just twenty percent, which is more than double the, than the sector median. But when we look at Palantir's five year average of thirty two percent, this growth number is actually pretty low. And like I said, that this most recent quarter they reported the slowest revenue growth in the company's history. So revenue growth is slowing, which is unfortunate. And we also have over the next 12 months, we're projected to basically stay flat in terms of revenue with about 20% revenue, which once again is above the sector median, but below Palantir's five-year average. So th this company is used to, um, you know, reporting revenue that is growing at a pretty fast clip, right? Over the past five years, it's been 32% per percent as a in, in, in terms of revenue growth. So that is um, that definitely shows you that revenue growth is slowing somewhat, which I don't love to see. But, you know, it this this company has kind of made its investors very um, uh, accustomed to high growth. And unfortunately, in this quarter, they just aren't delivering that. So that, that, that's kind of the one bugaboo investors are having. And, and I would say that's that's really the reason shares are dropping today is that slow revenue growth. So with, with that being said, though, let's take a look at the company's profitability metrics. So we can see gross profit is at 78%, which is well above the sector median and is above Palantir's five-year average, which we love to see. So... Gross profit, for those that don't know, basically just tells you what a company makes when it sells something. So this is basically just revenue minus cost of goods sold. I always use this example. If I were running a lemonade stand and it cost me 22 cents to make lemonade and I was selling it for a dollar, my gross profit margin would be 78%. So that's just a quick example to kind of tell you, um, you know, 
what this actually means. So this 78% is nothing to sneeze at and it's definitely a great sign for the company that they're moving closer and closer towards profitability. Obviously, they just had that, that profitable profitable quarter. Um, and then net income margin at minus 12%, which isn't the best number and it's actually below the sector median, but it's well above Palantir's five-year average of minus 66%. So this kind of goes with our general theme that Palantir is moving closer and closer towards sustained profitability. And then the company also has 60 cents in cash per share, which isn't much, right? Um, you know, but it is good to see that they, they at least have some cash on hand that definitely gives the company somewhat of a firm ability to fund its future operations and that's about roughly you know four percent of the market cap is in cash with that being said though let's take a look at how the company stacks up relative to peers so datadog autodesk and a couple others here let's start off with its balance sheet though right so we were just talking about that cash holding which is 60 cents per share about four percent of the market cap but the balance sheet looks absolutely beautiful you Tip, and just like fundamentally, a company doesn't issue a buyback program when their balance sheet looks poor. That just doesn't really happen. Uh, so it's it's not super shocking to see that this they have a great balance sheet. So the company has two point nine billion dollars in cash and two hundred and fifty million dollars in debt. So that means that they have two point six billion dollars more cash than they do debt, which is a great thing for shareholders. It. it Basically, it implies that, that the company won't be diluting shareholders anytime soon, and they have the, the money to fund their, their operations, you know, despite any major economic downturn, which is obviously good and, you know, gives investors some stability. So, this number also ranks out pretty well amongst the peers. So, we do have Datadog, who has more cash than, than debt, um, but the others are more debt ridden so with that being said palantir has an absolutely amazing looking balance sheet but let's take a look at how these profitability metrics rank out so <clears throat> gross profit margin of 78 percent is basically in line with datadog but is actually underperforming the other peers so that is worth noting and then net income margin is negative basically in line with datadog and is pretty much in line with most peers as we have two other negative peers. So overall gross profit margins are definitely below the the general or excuse me the the close peers, but at the end of the day they're they're not significantly below the close peers which tells me that there isn't really cause to concern when we look at those profitability numbers and as I said Palantir's profitability is getting better and better. But let's look at the company's three-year compounded annual growth rates. The company has a three-year compounded annual growth rate of 35%, which is below Datadog at 61%, and basically in line with the other peers. So once again here, we're underperforming Datadog, but we are outperforming some of the peers here. So I would basically say we're in line in terms of growth. And then valuation right now. So Let's just look three years out just to be a little bit more fair to Palantir. So three years out, we should have a 54 times PE, which is in line with Datadog, but a, a little bit more expensive than the other peers. Obviously, these peers don't have a massive pull towards AI like Palantir does. So I would say this valuation is 100% justified. Um, and, you know, we're, we're basically in line with Datadog, and but we're a little more expensive than some of the peers. So valuation looks good as well and then price to book ratio looks pretty solid as well so we have a 14 times price to book which is below datadog and below autodesk and a couple others so with that being said let's take a look at the price performance for the stock so we can see here that yes shares have been outperforming the close peers since late may and typically when when, when a stock is outperforming its general peer group, or excuse me, its close peer group, that outperformance tends to continue. So it is a good sign to see that investors are preferring Palantir over the close peers. That's always a good sign. And then with that being said, let's take a look at some of the other opinions we are seeing on Wall Street for the company. So 
In terms of analyst ratings, we see six bearish ratings on the stock, and then we see five bullish ratings on the stock, and then seven are kind of in between. So this was, this is a stock that you could refer to as a battleground stock, meaning that there are a wide range of opinions out there on the market for the stock. So you can see that here with, with the price target. So the lowest price target is five bucks and the highest price target is $34. So that, that kind of shows you the wide range of uh, opinions out there on the market. And then we can see the most recent upgrades and downgrades from the earnings call. So we can see here that City maintained a sell and moved their price target to $10. And we saw Raymond James maintain and outperform and they increased their price target to $22. And then Wedbush reiterated their outperform rating at $25. Bucks. And this is uh, Dan Ives. Um, he's from Wedbush. Um, so that doesn't that doesn't shock me that they're uh, con continuing to be bullish. And then Mizuho, they increased their price target to sixteen dollars, but remained neutral on the stock. And then Wolf Research increased their price target to seven dollars and fifty cents, and maintained their underperform rating. And then Citigroup increased their price target to ten bucks, but maintained a sell rating on the stock. So. Overall, we're three, we're three to three in terms of bulls to bears. Um, just reacting to this recent note, uh, or excuse me, this this recent earnings report. So, in reaction to the earnings report, we've seen once again mixed reactions throughout the market. But it is a good sign to see that even the bears on the street are raising their price targets to make it more logical, right? So, Citigroup had a pretty aggressive price target at six, $6, but raised their price target to 10 bucks in reaction to earnings. So yes, they, they maintained their bearish sell rating, but they increased their price target to 10 bucks, which is obviously a good thing for shareholders. So that is all good to see. And then in terms of short interest, we can see here that the company has 7% of the float sold short which isn't that much. And then we also have days to cover of 1.6. Typically when we're looking for a short squeeze, we look for a days to cover number of 10. For those that don't know, this 1.6 number basically just tells me that it takes 1.6 days of average volume to cover the shares that are sold short. And 7% isn't a horrible number, but it's actually been declining. So over the past short interest period, we saw shorts decline 6%. So maybe that's a theme that we see continuing here. Um, so with that being said, I wouldn't say the stock has a high likelihood for a short squeeze just based on all the short squeeze data. Um, but if I had to give it a give it a grade, I would give it like a C minus to a D plus in terms of short squeeze potential. So with that being said, let's give our price prediction for the stock. First off, this is not financial advice. Do your own research. But as promised, I will give my price prediction based on technical analysis. So just today, we came down to test this 50-day moving average at about $16.16. .16. This is where shares had also bottomed in late July. So this, this kind of support level is coinciding with this 50 DMA, which leads me to believe that this $16 level is a pretty good level to add some shares. And, you know, we have pretty bullish momentum as well for the stock so we're trading above all daily moving averages which is a good signal for shares um, and then also we can see that this major support level at about 17 bucks is almost holding up today so <clears throat> i call this level support because this is where we have topped out in the past so in mid-june we topped out around this level and then in Early June, we also topped out around this $17 level. Past resistance becomes new support. So now that we're coming down to test this level, I believe we hold this level and move higher over the coming weeks. <clears throat> and this is also where shares had bottomed in May on the 8th, or excuse me, the 11th of May in 2021. So this definitely is a, a significant level of support for the stock, and I believe it likely holds 
and leads to a move higher over the coming weeks for the stock. In terms of a short-term price per prediction, I would say we likely move up to resistance at around 21 bucks, which is where shares had bottomed in June, excuse me, in July of 2021. It's also where shares had bottomed in March of 2021. And like I just said, past support becomes new resistance. I believe we see that here. So, and we also topped out around this level on August 1st. So I, I, I think a quick move from 17 to 21 is likely in the coming weeks, barring any massive sell-off throughout the throughout the market. So that is my price target for Palantir. But with, with that being said, let's take a look at some of the seasonality trends for the stock. So unfortunately, on average, shares decline 9% in August. Obviously, we only have two years of pricing data here, so this isn't the end-all be-all. But it is good to see that, that we're moving into September and October, which have been seasonally bullish months as shares have risen 7% and 3% respectively in September and October, which is a great sign um, for the stock. But the most important is these technicals, which I do believe are going to hold up. And we could see a move higher to 21 bucks over the coming weeks. $21 isn't my final price target on the stock. I'd really want to see, you know, more pricing, um, or excuse me, more earnings info, more profitability metrics before I gave kind of a long-term price target. But talking about purely technicals, you could, you could kind of say that about 27 bucks could be the next major level of resistance for the stock. So if you were, you know, looking for a long-term price target, that $27 level seems like a logical one. So in conclusion, you know, the company reported I what I think is a better earnings report than the market is giving them credit for right now. Obviously, um, the general market is down, so that's likely exacerbating the move lower. But the company has a significant AI opportunity, and the financials look very solid as well, especially when you compare them to peers. Therefore, I believe this company is a great long-term hold, especially if you're looking for some AI exposure and the chart is reading bullish. So with that being said, I hope you enjoyed the video. I will end it there. If you got some value from this video, please leave a like. We post company breakdowns and important market moving news on this channel on a daily basis. So make sure you are subscribed. If you would like to receive my daily portfolio moves, my exits, my entries, and see how me and my team of analysts are trading the markets, join the Discord through the link in the description below to get our free 7-day trial. Also, if you would like to join our free daily newsletter, sign up to our Substack, which is linked below as well. With that being said, good luck everyone, happy trading, happy investing.